Over on this channel, we have covered a lot, a lot of Hellraiser stories. I think we're almost reaching about 20 different stories throughout this franchise, and it's usually always something, you know, extremely entertaining, something that brings a little more lore to the entirety of the Black Diamond God that lives Leviathan, something that makes opening the Lamarcan Cube worth it. But with this story, and one of the shortest Hellraiser stories that I've ever actually came across, I would say I was a little let down, and this isn't just some little piece of entertainment. This is actually an origin story to one of the bigger Xenobites, a Xenobite that we've seen in the Hellraiser Holiday Special, and a character that I actually really enjoyed, being very vocal, being very animated, and actually giving a little bit more of a backstory on himself, and a little bit more than I think this entire story does on his own character. And it's a story that only runs for about four pages, and while it is interesting being actually about a soldier in the Vietnam War, and actually getting to see the origin story of Atkins or the armor kind of meet the Xenobites for the first time in one of the most weirdest, most obvious symbolic puzzles that I've ever really quite seen, actually being a labyrinth, actually being amazed, quite quite literally, being down in a foxhole, trying to take out a bunch of various different enemies and things like this. And overall, it's really just something that's not sitting with me too well. So it is something that I'd like to share with you all, and I'd like to hear your theory about what exactly Atkins does in his role of being a Cenobite. And what this story is called is Tunnel of Love. And where this would all begin is a platoon in the Vietnam War with, sadly, a low body count. And actually coming across one of these foxholes, one of these hidden dens of their enemies needing to go down and actually bring their numbers up. Something that I find very dark. As we all know, this is Hellraiser and they, they just don't really care, I don't know, if it's insensitive. <laughs> So, without a further ado, everybody, let's get right into this story, let's break it down, and let's see what you all think of it. Shit. What is it, Sergeant? What's the holdup? Tunnel, sir. Well, isn't this Vietnam War the goddamnedest thing you ever saw? Soldiers tunneling under the earth like worms. How about that? Well, I guess you good old boys know what this means. Our body counts for shit this week, and I believe I'm gonna need a volunteer to go down into that tunnel and bring me back some ears. Now, come on. Somebody step up. I'll do it. Well, that's what I like to hear. Atkins, that you? What took you so long to speak up? Not like you to hang back like that. And with these next couple of panels, this character, Atkins, or the Xenobite the Armor, really wouldn't say much, other than asking his sergeant if he can merely borrow his pistol to engage the enemy firsthand and all by himself. And with our next panel, we would get to see a sergeant hovering over his shoulder and looking like the most evil symbolic metaphor for Uncle Sam, a man who would continue to push these body counts to do nothing other than to impress the high ranking soldiers. And with this, only telling Atkins that of course he can use his pistol, that he wants to hear the enemy screaming clear through the dirt, and telling him to go get them doggies. And with this, Atkins would only say see you around, and we would see him making his way into these dark and treacherous tunnels. And as he's making his way, the rest of the platoon would wonder why they would send this man alone. That this isn't really the normal procedure, and the only thing that the sergeant would have to say is that if Atkins was only left butt naked in a field, surrounded by the enemy, with nothing but a penknife on his side, that they still would have no chance. That this is exactly what this man was born for, and that overall, this man will be just fine. And with our next panel, and something that I totally missed on a first read, as I was very confused on what exactly was going on here, to what exactly had unlocked the Xenobites that we'll see towards the ending of the story, and it's something so very obvious. As we look to the left side of this panel, we would see not only a Lamarckand cube, or at least a small piece of it, something that would mark the location of a Xenobite territory, and a place that would seem to be protected by these very same entities. And something that I've never really seen before, is with the next couple of panels, we will learn that the Xenobites are actually protecting a small group of these enemy soldiers down underneath these foxholes. Only this would all come to an end, and a complete stop, and one of the most vicious rampagings that I've ever quite seen. And as Atkins makes his way through these tunnels, he would finally see the light of the enemy. It's showtime, folks. And with the next panel, we would see Atkins blasting through five different soldiers, and actually running up to the next, and pulling out nothing but a knife, and putting an end to this whole operation. And as everybody is screaming, with their lives being taken from them so fast, Atkins would only apologize that he's just doing his job. Bob. And with the last and final enemy afoot, he would take to a small investigation. Where are the rest of you? We are everywhere, you dog! 
You will never get out of here alive. We are special, and we are protected by the Sino. Sorry, heard it all before. Say goodnight, Gracie. And as Atkins would go on to snap the neck of this last enemy, and actually cutting off a piece of crucial information that I personally really would have liked to hear, to actually hear what kind of deal has been made with these Cenobites, as the only time I've really ever seen this made is with Face actually coercing people to do his bidding, to bring him more souls, to bring him more faces, and to continue to do the wrongdoings that he would need to see to satiate his need, as well as the Black Diamond God Leviathan. And this really was kind of the first letdown of this whole situation. To have this moment to actually kind of flesh out these characters, to actually, you know, flesh out the lore of the Cenobites, we would never get to know. And with our next panel, we would see Atkins realizing that he needs to make his way out, and that little tenant is just going to be happy with six pairs of ears. And while to me, it seems like a great abundance of ears, apparently, is just not enough. I gotta find my way out of here. Shit, I could swear this place is shifting on me. I know I've been through here before. Jesus Christ, this looks familiar too. Feels like some crazy pattern. And with the next panel, and Atkins kind of realizing that he keeps continuing past the same exact spot, the same exact spot that he's crossed through separate times, he would have enough. And he would pull out of his knife, and he would begin to dig topside, actually piercing the ground above him. And while you might think this could be a terrible idea, that the ground above him could crash down upon him and actually suffocate this man, it would do the exact opposite. And as he would continue to chip away, a beam of light would shoot through. And as Atkins thinks that he has merely reached the top, that he's finally found his way out, it would actually only be shown that this is the final piece of the puzzle, of whatever actually solved this entire situation, and with our next panel, we would be greeted by none other Leviathan himself, accompanied by various Xenobites that we have never really quite seen before, and only one that looks moderately familiar, actually being from the hospital story of the woman who was created into a creature of devastating hands. And while I don't really think that this is the returning of that creature, Atkins, at this point, would still not be phased whatsoever. And in the face of the Xenobites would only continue to be his own man. Oh man, now what? You have summoned us, and you must return with us. Sure thing, laughing boy. I'm not going anywhere but back to my platoon. Man, more crazy shit in this crazy war. You must come with us to Leviathan, where you will be remade. Blow me, blue boy. What if I say no? Then we will take you by force. Fine with me, fellas. I've always loved a good fight. And this, sadly, would be the end of our story, and quite crucially, the shortest Hellraiser story that I've ever come across, and something that while I thought was cool to actually get a returning scene of Atkins the Armor, and while I don't know if this actually came before the Hellraiser Holiday Special, it's just something that let me down a little bit, and really the first time in these Hellraiser comic books from the 1980s that has done so to me. Something that I thought could be much cooler as some of the origin stories that we've come across thus so far, things like Faze's origin story, where it really seemed like a good, you know, next step in the direction of a good Hellraiser movie, of a man who was actually going around kind of suffering from dementia while also, you know, being shown signs from all these different demons or these creatures from hell and actually being shown a way to enter their Reich. It managed to be one of the more impressive Hellraiser stories that I've ever heard. And to actually come across something like this, this origin story, I really was expecting a little bit more. I think the intro of this could have been alright, but if it would have just extended on to Atkins actually going into hell with the Sun of Whites, um, actually going through his changes, and us actually being shown what it is exactly he does under the Black Diamond God Leviathan, is something that, at this point, I can only wish for, and something that I can only hope to see in further Hellraiser comic books that I, you know, happen to come across. It's we don't really know much about this man, other than he holds a gun belt, and that he has various different grenades and things like that, things that we've seen in the Hellraiser Holiday Special, and it's just a person that I really enjoyed in that story, and somebody that I really, you know, didn't get to enjoy so much in this story. So overall, everybody, what did you think of this? Do you have any theories about what exactly this man actually does? Does create the weapons for the demons down in hell to actually brandish for their war on the flesh? And a means for the land of the Gash to take forward territory? 
And if anybody knows where I can find more of this story, I would be very much glad to see so. But anyways, everybody, thank you so much for watching. I'm sorry it's such a short episode, but it is an extension of the lore technically, and I've been wanting to do another kind of origin story, and this so far is the only one I've been able to find. At some point, I'm gonna have to pick up some more of these books. I believe I have one through seven, and I need to get the rest of them. But there's still plenty more Hellraiser to go, and uh, next time we return to this franchise, we'll have something a little more deep, something you know, a little more serious. But anyways, everybody, have yourself an absolutely fantastic day, and I thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you on the next episode of From the Heart, with whatever I decide to, you know, share with you all. Have yourself a fantastic day.